Yeah. Well, thank you very much to Sunjay and Kim Young and the rest of the organizers for putting this meeting together. Um, I'm really looking, it's, it's tough for me uh, to be able to tune into these talks live, but uh, what a wonderful set of speakers and topics you've assembled. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be able to contribute. Uh, this talk today is going to be based on some recent work with Jordan Kotler, who's now a postdoc at Harvard. Um, the bulk of it will be based on a couple of papers that appeared on Archive this summer. And there are two more papers uh, that we are wrapping up perhaps by the end of September, but perhaps not. I don't want to jinx myself, so I left it in the possibility that perhaps they'll appear October and later. I'm listing them here. Anyway, let's get started. Uh, so this talk is about a fairly basic property of ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, we're now 23 years into ADS-CFT, so we know it quite well. It's an old friend. I think I was 13 when it came into being. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so most of my life has been spent with it one way or another. Um, as we now know very well, a the ADS-CFT correspondence equates consistent theories of quantum gravity with CFTs. And the best understood examples, the gravity side is string theory or M theory, and the CFT is you know, something highly supersymmetric, or maybe less so, but something that can be realized by a brain construction. And the correspondence includes a dictionary, which allows us to relate gravitational and CFT observables to each other. Today, we're going to exclusively consider uh, the Euclidean aspects of the correspondence. So quantum gravity and Euclidean signature and Euclidean control of the theory. We'll get to the basic property in question shortly. Bear with me for a few slides. And we remind you the most basic formula in all of ADS CFT, the thing from which most of it uh, has been useful, is an equation that relates the partition function of a conformal field theory with some sources for operators collectively labeled by J. And well, that's equal to the path integral of quantum gravity in space times with appropriate boundary conditions and negative cosmological constant. So if we're talking about the, the paradigmic duality between n equals four and type 2b on ADS five times S five, then, well, the left-hand side is the n equals four partition function, and the right-hand side is supposed to be a, what we mean by the path integral for type 2b string theory on ADS five times S five. And in the duality, the, well, if we introduce sources J in conformal field theory for operators O, well, we know how to do that. We simply take, uh, at least in the theories with the Lagrangian description, we deform the action of the CFT by the integral of source involved with operator. In gravity, how does it work? Well, maybe a CFT is a field operator correspondence. So an operator O is related to a field called phi in the higher dimensional space time. And there is a way to relate sources for operators in CFT to boundary conditions um, for a field phi in higher dimension, which I've sort of pictorially represented here. If one turned on a source for some operator O localized at two points x1 and x2 on the boundary of ADS, well, call that a couple of dots on the boundary of ADS. Um, that would correspond in, in gravity to um, adjusting the boundary conditions for phi so that it grows appropriately near the boundary of ADS um, at the points x1 and x2 with an amount determined by the source j at those points. So this is well understood. Now there's something that we can do in gravity that does not have an, obvi an obvious CFT analog. Well, what, can, what is that? We can consider space times which have multiple boundaries. The standard boundary conditions in ADS CFT, what they do is they basically anchor down the space time geometry near the boundary. So, for instance, if we study um, you know, the, the quantum gravity problem where we impose there are two boundaries, well, the boundary conditions basically tell us that the geometry is approximately ADS near those two boundaries, 
But then quantum mechanics allows anything in the interior and allows us to fill up the rest of that space time in all possible ways. This is kind of reminiscent from, you know, when we teach quantum field theory to young people and we say, well, if we look at some scattering process, then we allow for any intermediate state and we sum over all of them. And we commonly denote that by you know, some external arrows representing the asymptotic states, the boundary conditions, and then a big blob in the interior referring to the sum over all possible physical processes. In space-time, well, the corresponding kind of picture that you would draw on a two-boundary problem would be something like this, where B1 and B2 label the two different boundary components. So you can set up a problem, at least you know, on paper in quantum gravity, where you have two asymptotic regions, asymptotically ADS regions, and well, you sum up all possible things that, connect, that uh, happen in between. Well, there's two sorts of things that can happen at the level of space, uh, smooth space-time geometry. There's two ways of filling this in. You might imagine um, completely disconnected configurations where the two boundaries don't talk to each other at all. There's no smooth, there's no space time that connects them. Um, and well, there can be, you can imagine connected contributions which smoothly connect the two asymptotic regions. Those things um, in this talk, those are what I mean by Euclidean wormholes. And they pose quite a, a puzzle in the tr standard understanding of the ADFC of T correspondence. So in an equation, <laughs> if you take the standard, um, well, in an equation, what one has here is that in this two boundary problem is that the gravity path integral, whatever that means, um, subject to the boundary conditions that there's two boundaries, label them by B1 and B2, well, that would be equal to a sum over completely disconnected geometries Z, the part, you know, the one boundary path integral with boundary B1 times the same thing with boundary B2 um, plus connect configurations that connect the two asymptotic regions, we'll just call connected contributions. And the puzzle with ADS CFT comes about when you try to relate these gravity path integrals to CFT observables. The left-hand side, you would say, if there is a dual CFT, you would say, well, that's the CFT partition function on the space given by the union of the two boundary components, so B1 union B2. And on the other hand, on the right-hand side, the thing with the single boundary, you would say, ah, oh, well, that's the CFT partition function on B1 or on B2 separately. And the puzzle is that, well, CFT partition functions factorize by virtue of locality. The partition function on the union of, on the disjoint union of two spaces is just equal to the partition function on one times the partition function on the other. That's a consequence of locality. And as far as you might, well, you might wonder, well, if we're doing media CFT and we don't have we're studying just general aspects of gravity and ADS. How do I know that locality is there? And well, we can talk about that, but basically for, if there is a dual description to some random theory of quantum gravity and ADS, um, it's guaranteed to be local by virtue of uh, the um, behavior of Einstein's equations near each boundary. Um, so what gives? How can it be the case then that one has an equation like this um, I, I can't write, you know, point to it on the board, but this thing with the two boundary, equaling one boundary, one boundary plus connected, how can that be consistent with the usual factorization of CFT partition functions? Well, and the answer is, I mean, basically there's two options. The obstruction to CFT factorization would be all these connected geometries, the potential contribution of Euclidean wormholes to the gravity path integral. And there's essentially two options. Either those contributions are zero, either because they're just all individually zero or they add up to zero. Um, presumably, that's the case in all the standard examples, all the lampposts of ADS CFT that we know and love, like the duality between n equals four and type to be on ADS five times S five, where we really know that what's going on. 
A priori, there's another possibility, which is that all the connected stuff, the contribution from Euclidean wormholes, is not zero. How do you make sense of that? Well, if that is indeed the case, then it follows that um, the left-hand side of this equation, the, the two-boundary partition function, well, or the partition function on B1 union B2, well, it would follow that that is not a product of CFT partition functions, which would be the right-hand side up to connected terms. What you would conclude basically is that the CFT partition function, the set of the dual CFT, well, the Z would not be a C number. It would not be a, just a, a normal number. Instead, it would be a random variable drawn from some distribution with an identification that the, the gravity path integral with a single boundary, you would say, ah, well, that's like the ensemble average of the CFT partition function on B. And the two boundary thing you would say is the two point function drawn from this distribution of the CFT partition function. I.e. not, and this would, if this happens well, this would clearly not be what is the usual thing in ADS CFT where a single instance of n equals four at fixed values of the coupling constant is dual to type two B string theory with fixed boundary conditions. So there's a real puzzle here um, that can be attacked in quantum gravity, which is, well, you know, do these Euclidean wormholes contribute to the gravity path integral or not? At least within the, well, the, the usual approximations uh, that, we, that we use when studying effective field theory in ADS. Now I should tell you an, a little bit about what is known uh, about Euclidean wormholes in string theory. There uh, are sorry, Euclidean... Uh, Christian, I have a question. Yeah. So here you adding some random uh, variable and the ensemble average, and the, from the point of view of quantum gravity, the um, unitarity is uh, also naturally appear, or how, how about the is unitarity of the gra gravity? Yeah, so everything I'm, I'm talking about here is in Euclidean signature. So I guess the, the real question is whether or not reflection positivity would be manifest in this picture. And I have to think about it. I mean, I, I, maybe one way of, of answering the question is to punt a little bit and to say that, uh, well, yeah, so I, let's see. So the basic question that I want to attack today is whether or not these wormholes contribute or not in gravity. And one could ask if they do, uh, does that lead to some conflict with reflection positivity and therefore unitarity in the Lorentzian continuation? And I don't think there is, um, but I haven't thought about it carefully enough to feel confident giving an answer. But the, for this, the purpose of this talk today, I'm going to focus on a much more coarse grained uh, um, property, if you will, simply does the part, the, the gravity path integral factorize or not? Do wormholes contribute? Okay, thank you. Yeah. So there are known such solutions in supergravity with negative cosmological constant. I imagine this is one of the things that Kim Young worked on in, uh, in a past life. Um, many of these configurations fall under the name of axion wormholes, uh, originally introduced in some work of Giddings and Strominger and many others back in the 80s, um, in which one studies uh, Einstein Yang Mills coupled to the massless scalar, called an axion. Um, and well, there are more recent wormhole solutions in supergravity that have been obtained by Mao Saint and Maus. Um, um, in 2004, for instance, coming from quotients of hyperbolic space in such a way that the boundary of the quotient is a disjoint union of two higher genus surfaces. And there are also some examples, so that's an ADS-3, three dimensions. 
And there's also some other subtle points that they studied uh, in gravity coupled to Yang Mills in four and five dimensions where there's a non-trivial uh, flux background for the Mills gauge field such that uh, it supports the wormhole. And the thing is, is that I don't know if it's well appreciated now that people are looking back at these things again, is that these configurations are always unstable for one reason or another. Sometimes they're due to brain nucleation instabilities, as is the case for these uh, quotients of hyperbolic space studied by Nabusain and Maos. Um, there are also, uh, it can be the case that light scalars condense, as happens uh, in some of these examples of gravity coupled to Yang Mills. Or for the axion wormholes, they are pretty much universally unstable to the production of spatially inhomogeneous uh, perturbations, a fact that was recently uncovered in a paper of Hertog, Chilijian, and Van Reet just a couple of years ago. So these things can appear. You can find saddles, um, wormhole saddles, but they're universally unstable. which might lead you to think that, well, then maybe that's always the case in traditional examples of ADS-CFT. However, there is one notable case where Euclidean wormholes do contribute and they are vital in our understanding of a holographic duality. And that's in the context of something that people have studied a lot the last several years, Shaki Tidalboy and gravity, I've seen some talks on it. Um, in, well, some people sometimes just call it JT gravity for short. Um, it turns out that the JT path integral is well-defined on any genus surface with any number of boundaries. So at the level of a, a genus expansion, JT gravity is a consistent theory of quantum gravity. And in following the standard uh, lore that we all sort of adhere to, you might hope then, you would expect then that JT is dual to something. It has a, a quantum mechanical dual. And Sodschenker and Stanford showed last year that in fact, that dual, that, well, there is such a dual. And it's a certain um, one-dimensional system. Well, you can think of it as a one-dimensional ensemble of Hamiltonians or as a zero plus zero dimensional integral, namely a very large matrix integral, a double scale matrix, call it H. You, you think about it as that matrix H is a Hamiltonian, um, then you can think about this as uh, duality between a two-dimensional theory of quantum gravity and an ensemble of quantum mechanical systems with Hamiltonian H. Now in this duality, uh, inserting a boundary of some fixed renormalized length, beta, uh, corresponds to, in random matrix theory, inserting a factor of thermal partition function, trace e to the minus beta h, into the random matrix average. So for instance, the problem that I talked about a little bit before with two boundaries of lanes beta 1 and beta 2 would correspond to a two-point function in the dual matrix integral of trace e to the minus beta h's. So this is one example where well, the Euclidean wormholes, if you will, are stable, they contribute and they're vital. In this case, the most basic wormhole, the thing with two boundaries, is telling us about the fluctuation statistics of the matrix model, the dual matrix model, which is a very basic observable in random matrix theory. Twenty minutes in, let me say what I'm gonna do from here. So that's all sort of setting up the rest of this talk. What am I going to do and what follows? What are the new results I'll show? Um, well, the bulk of the talk is going to be a discussion of an exact computation of a basic wormhole amplitude in three-dimensional gravity, uh, which will, um, so in pure gravity in three dimensions with no matter content. And what we'll find is that there'll be a surprising connection to the physics of random matrix theory there. That's where what I'll spend most of the time on. And then from there, what we'll do in the end is to obtain new wormholes uh, in three and higher space-time dimension as uh, non-perturbative contributions to Einstein gravity. 
These are not instantons per se. They are not solutions to the Einstein field equations, um, but rather they're sort of the next best thing, something that in the literature is called a constrained instanton. And we'll discuss what that means. But these are important contributions to the path integral of Einstein gravity, whatever that means. At the end, I'll talk about uh, stability analysis of these wormholes. Uh, there'll be a whole class that I write down that are stable within Einstein gravity. They're completely stable to quadratic ordering fluctuations. However, um, we'll be able to embed these wormholes into string theory where we'll find that they are unstable, sort of uh, morally along the lines of uh, what's known for solutions, honest to God solutions to uh, supergravity field equations that I just discussed a slide ago. Uh, sorry, one question, Christian. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, one question. Mm -hmm. the, yes. The wormholes in JT gravity, are they also unstable if you derive JT gravity from a near horizon limit of a black hole, like in a full-fledged theory? I didn't hear the first part of that sentence. In the JT gravity wormholes, are they also yeah. un the JT gravity wormholes? Are yeah. they also unstable when you think about them as part of uh, you know the near horizon limit of some string theory? Uh Actually, that's one of the things that's a little trickier to analyze. Um, I believe so, but I, I, I don't have a proof yet. Presumably this is the case, but I don't have a proof yet. The, the tricky thing, how to say, um, I, maybe I'll just save it for when we get there. Okay, so let's talk about some exact results in 3D gravity. So let me remind you a few facts about three-dimensional gravity. It's a toy model that people have studied for years for various aspects of gravity. The classical model is exactly soluble on the disk times time. That is uh, for metrics that are smoothly connected to the solution to the field equations uh, of global ADS-3. The model has no propagating degrees of freedom, no bulk gravitons, because you're in less than four dimensions. However, it does have boundary excitations, commonly referred to as boundary gravitons, um, which have power counting or normalizable interactions that are suppressed by uh, factors of the Newton constant in units of the ADS radius, which in examples of ADS CFT, where you know, there really is a dual conformal field theory, um, well, that ratio is essentially one over the central charge. So the boundary gravitons are weakly coupled at large central charge or at large ADS radius. This model, maybe less well known, has an analog of the Schwarzian description that appears in JT gravity. In other words, you can reduce the path integral of 3D gravity to a boundary path integral with some degrees of freedom that are closely related to what one finds in JT gravity and also appears in the context of some mathematical physics. The relevant words are quantization of coadjoint orbits of the Virasoro group. That's not gonna to be too important for us today. Um, some basic things one can study in 3D gravity are, um, at least in Euclidean signature, are the path integral on the disk times the circle, uh, meaning you know, take hyperbolic three space and quotient it by Z. Take Euclidean, equivalently take Euclidean global ADS and then um, compactify Euclidean time with some periodicity. In that case, the boundary is some torus with complex structure tau. And well, one can actually perform the gravity half integral. And it's equal to this thing that you may have heard about at some point, the maloney witten partition function. Uh, which is built out of a, well, out of a building block. And what is that building block? The building block is the vacuum character of Virasoro, which I've written here as Z naught. This is what you get for um, the path integral for 3D gravity on disk times S1, where the spatial circle of 
um, that appears in the vacuum character is the, 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 the boundary of the disk in disk times S1. Um, vacuum character is not modular invariant. Um, it no, if you will, uh, it picks out one direction of the torus relative to the other. Space is different from time. That's manifest in three dimensions because the boundary of the disk is contractible, but the thermal circle, the S1 factor, is not. And, well, what happened? What happens? Well, the actual gravity path integral over configurations of this sort includes a modular sum. You sum over all possible ways that a circle on the boundary can be filled in, in the interior, and that ends up giving you a modular sum, a sum over vacuum characters, where the um, modular parameter tau is um, modular transform. That's essentially what I've written here. And this is the uh, Maloney-Witten partition function of 3D gravity. And there's various things to be said about it. They arrived at it essentially using some um, more canonical methods, whereby you construct a Hilbert space of states for 3D gravity on the disk, and then basically um, use symmetry to obtain tracy of the minus beta h, um, and then uh, attach to that a modular sum. And with Jordan Kotler a couple of years ago, we performed a path integral uh, version of this computation, which is one with the exact and leads to the same result for some appropriate one loop or normalized essential charge of 3D gravity. But That's kind of old news. The thing that I want to talk more about today is the next simplest geometry you can consider, which is that of the annulus times S1, something with two boundaries, equivalently the torus times the interval. The boundary is composed of two disjoint tori with complex structures, tau1 and tau2. Uh, but Christian, in Maloney Witten, they just chose judiciously what to include, what not to include. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary. Well, what they were doing, how to say, um, yeah, through the thing that was well defined that they were doing was a sum over metrics which are continuously uh, connected to Euclidean global ADS3. Yeah, first of all, they didn't take complexified metrics, which I don't know why. That, that's not justified, I think. And secondly, they did not look at some uh, geometries which are slightly singular. That's right. They were studying real smooth spaces, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to, well, we could have easily um, an hour's worth of discussions uh, about the merits of the assumptions that they, uh, how to say, of the definitions that they take for the 3D gravity path integral. Um, I'm sure it will be very fruitful, uh, but that is, that's what they did. And I guess maybe this is a point worth saying now that I'm going to take the attitude in this part of the talk that we want to, you know, there's a whole question. What do you mean by Euclidean quantum gravity? What, what does that mean? What things are you summing over? What are you not? And we're going to adhere to a similar doctrine in this part of the talk. We're going to try to integrate over real non-singular metrics and see what sense can be made out of it. Does that address what you have on your mind, Zohar? Or do you want to go further into this? No, no. I, I just, I, mean, I was just saying that it's a little, what they did is a little arbitrary and it kind of leads to nonsensical results. Yes, so for those that don't know about this, the, what you end up finding for this partition function is two, well, this modular sum diverges. And if you regularize it in a modular invariant way, you find two features. One is that the ensuing density of states is continuous. That is, well, that immediately rules out the prospect of a compact dual description. Um, but you also find that there are negative norm states. This was something that was noted originally and then has been refined in recent papers of Ugori, Shao, Benjamin. Um, and how to say, uh, you, that's the sense in which you get an answer, which is nonsensible as a torus partition function of a two dimensional conformal field theory. However, you know, what they do, they perform in, um, 
an integral over metrics of this sort that are topologically disk times S1, what you should really do if you're going to integrate over, if you're going to play by the rules of the game and integrate over smooth configurations with fixed asymptotics, is to sum over space-time topologies which are not connected to saddle points but are asymptotically, um, have the same asymptotics. And there is, how to say, um, I mean, this is, this is other people's work. There's some recent uh, impressive work of Maxfield and Turiachi, which would indicate that uh, if you sum over a class of higher topologies beyond this times S1, that those negative norm states, well, those are an artifact of just limiting your approximation to the path integral to disk times S1. That if you include higher, the effect of higher topologies, that the ensuing density of states is positive. And if that's indeed the case, then this pathology is, would be remedied. And you would end up with a dual description that has a continuous density of states, but is indeed has positive density. Okay. So I want to talk about the two torus partition function, if you will, torus times interval. And ideally, what we would like to compute um, is an integral over metrics with this fixed asymptotics and Einstein Hilbert action. We'll return to this a little bit later. We're at, are closer to knowing how to actually do this, but at least for this point of the talk, I'll mention that there's an immediate problem, which is that there are no smooth saddle points with these boundary conditions. So the usual program of finding saddle point and expanding around it breaks at the beginning. We have to do something else. So what Jordan and I did in the paper over the summer is we took a somewhat roundabout approach to this problem. You have a better way, some better ways of thinking about it now, but let me tell you first about the roundabout way. What we did first was to take 3D gravity in Lorentzian signature and to exploit the first order formulation. In first order formulation of gravity, what you do is you replace the metric with a Buellbein, or in three dimensions, a dry bind, as well as a spin connection. And the Einstein-Hilbert action, um, well, in three dimensions anyway, becomes this. And why is it first order? Well, this action, D here is the exterior derivative. This is an action which, unlike the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is second order in derivatives, well, this one is first order in derivatives. In particular, it's linear in time derivatives. And so you may regard it um, as a Hamiltonian path integral, if you've heard of such a thing. In other words, if you have a, a path integral where the action is linear in time derivatives, then you can think about the, the integral that you're doing as one over trajectories in phase space rather than in some configuration space. And schematically, you can think of the Hamiltonian as pq dot minus h and maybe supplemented with some constraints. Now in the context of 3D gravity, where you have this dry bind and spin connection, you can exploit the existence of the epsilon tensor uh, to form nice linear combinations of the two. And the 3D gravity action, uh, when written in terms of these linear combinations, looks like an action for chern simons theory with a uh, gauge group that at least locally would be SL2R times SL2R. I'm gonna write things down in a way that reflects this, although I would stress what we're going to actually do is to perform an integral over smooth non-singular metrics, not an integral over chern simons gauge fields but you can write things down this way. And why do I write it out this way? Well, there exists technology to um, compute chern simons partition functions um, on spaces which are S1 times spatial surface. Um, the approach is, well, if you stare at this action for a little bit, the heart of the approach 
is to note that the field, the time component of the, the turn Simon's gauge field, A naught, or here equivalently the time components of the dry bind and spin connection, the gravitational variables, that they appear linearly and therefore act as Lagrange multipliers in the quantum theory rather than real dynamical degrees of freedom. So an approach that you can take is to first integrate those out, uh, thereby imposing uh, constraints, and then to perform the rest of the functional integral over the constraint system. What are the constraints? Well, the ones that you would find from this are simply the condition that the, you know, if this was churn simons theory, it would be that the spatial field strength is zero. In terms of gravitational variables, that's really the condition that spatial torsion is zero and that spatial curvature is related to um, spatial part of the dry line. And the nice thing about phrasing things in terms of these linear combinations, A and A bar, is that you can actually solve the constraints exactly. You know, if we were dealing with Chern-Simons gauge theory, it would just be the statement that the gauge field is uh, locally flat. That's G inverse DG. We're interested in Euclidean physics, not Lorentzian. So the approach that we took in this paper was to then analytically continue time to imaginary time and to simultaneously uh, rotate the field contour for the time component of the gravitational variables in such a way that, well, it still acts as a Lagrange multiplier. If we didn't do that, it wouldn't be the case. Um, in ordinary trend science theory, this would guarantee that the, this continuation would be the appropriate one for computing a trace over the Hilbert space of states on, say, the disk or some other surface. Um, but I mentioned this point because this is a, a bit of, um, you know, there are some rules of the game that we had to, to establish in order to have a well-defined computation. And the rules of the game here are perhaps a bit unexpected, uh, or the, the rules that we adhered to. The path integral that ensues from this has a different gauge group and factors of i than one would have in Euclidean first-order gravity. In particular, the gauge group is locally SL2R times SL2R instead of what you might have anticipated SL2C. So from there, having set up the problem, what did we do? Well, we looked at, um, we wanted to perform an integral over smooth spaces with uh, two asymptotic regions with torus boundary. And our approach was to uh, impose boundary conditions, solve these constraints, and the output of that is some rather complicated boundary action, uh, but it's, it's purely a two-dimensional, it's like a, it's just a residual 2D path integral that one can perform. The field content that one finds from this is a little tricky. There are two independent uh, degrees of freedom on each boundary, called them phi and phi bar. Um, they can depend anywhere on the boundary tori. And then there's some extra, I, I don't know what else to call them, you call them quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that depend on Euclidean time, but not on space. In Chern Simons, they would have the interpretation of indexing the holonomy of the Chern Simons gauge fields around the spatial circle. And those things would be functions of time, but not space. A simple example of a configuration that we can get from this is parametrized by, well, um, call it phi equals phi bar equals zero for both and some just constant B and B bar. Um, because we've integrated out time components of gravitational fields, the only thing that we have access to that's left is the spatial metric, which in this case looks like this. Um, this is a bottleneck geometry. If B was equal to B bar, then it would be constant curvature. This would be the um, constant curvature metric on the uh, constant negative curvature metric on the annulus. But for B not equal to B bar, it's just something else. 
and it smoothly, it's a completely smooth spatial metric as long as B and B bar are both non-negative. So B and B bar are both positive. B plus B bar has the physical interpretation of being the length of the bottleneck. If you go to row equals zero, that is a minimum, that's a geodesic around this uh, circle, this uh, length B plus B bar. The difference uh, has the interpretation of being a holonomy for the spin connection around that same circle. So if you are a field that carries spin and you go around the bottleneck, then you get parallel transported by an amount that depends on B minus B bar. And if you evaluate the gravitational action on this configuration, including the usual boundary, boundary counter terms required by holographic normalization, blah, 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 um, you end up with an action that looks like this. And it depends on B and B bar. This thing is not a saddle of Einstein's equations, but it is, or of the, the field equations of this thing. But it is, in some sense, the, um, the next best thing. Later in, in the language of constrained instantons, which we'll review later, this is a constrained instanton, where the parameters that are being fixed are what I'm calling B and B bar. In terms of more conventional black hole observables, those things are the mass, um, ADM mass and angular momentum perceived by the boundaries. Christian, are you allowed to have solutions which uh, like lead to a funny holonomy around the circle? That have what, sorry? Are you allowed to have solutions which lead to this funny holonomy for spinning particles around the circle? Are you allowed to have them? Yeah. Um, I, I don't see why. I haven't been able to find a reason why not. I mean, the, how to say, usually if you have a, holon a holonomy around a contractible cycle, would be bad. It would be imply a singularity, but in this case, uh, it's this is a completely smooth configuration. I'm just uh, thinking that in the CFT language, mm -hmm. uh, usually we require the spin of the vacuum to be maybe integral or half integral in extreme cases. Sure. Um, ah, I see what you're thinking. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to flash this boundary action. It's a bit complicated, but it has two properties so far. I, I wasn't going to talk about how one actually evaluates the path integral, but there are two things that are related to what you say. One is that these um, one of, two of the degrees of freedom enforce that this B and B bar are constant in time. And there is a sum over, there ends up also being a sum over uh, saddles in this theory which amounts to a sum over winding numbers, which quantizes this difference B minus B bar. And so the net effect is that when you perform at, at intermediate stages, there's no constraint on this B and B bar, um, but the path integral localizes over configurations where this spin is integral. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so for completeness, this is this nasty looking action that you get. Big parameter C here is the classical brown Hano central charge, 3L over 2G Newton. There are a bunch of different fields um, that appear, and the action is not terribly nice looking. Uh, it's a little daunting. Nevertheless, it can be evaluated exactly. I discussed this a bit more in a talk that I gave for the SITP uh, for Stanford back in June. It was recorded. You can take a look there for some details. Um, I'm also going to be giving a talk on, um, I guess it's Thursday your time uh, for an Indian strings meeting where I'll talk more about the technical details, how one does this. Um, but it, somewhat miraculously, it can be done exactly. And the net result is um, this fun formula. Um, the, the, the gravity path integral ends up being a constant times a product of uh, what you would call free boson partition functions, um, this thing I'm calling Z0, uh, times, well, the ratio that it is. Um, this is what you get at least 
uh, for um, an integral over space times where, well, you have two boundary tori where the spatial cycle of one torus becomes, if you follow it through the bulk, the spatial cycle of the other, and the temporal cycle of one torus becomes the temporal cycle of the other as you follow it through the bulk. And as we'll see in a moment, that is most of, but not all of the story for the torus times interval amplitude. Um, this thing that one finds is, um, it's not completely modular invariant. The, the free boson factors are in these Z naughts. Um, but the ratio m tau 1, m tau 2 over tau 1 plus tau 2 complex square, that's not modular invariant, but it's, it is invariant under something a bit smaller. It's invariant under simultaneous modular transformations of the two boundaries in the way that I've written. I said it's almost the whole result. The whole result is you take this configuration where tau one, well, how to say the spatial cycle of one thing is mapped to spatial cycle of the other, temporal circle is mapped to temporal circle, and you allow for any possible twist, um, Dane twist of a torus on one boundary relative to the other. In other words, if you allow for this configuration, you should allow for another one where space is mapped to time and time is mapped to space and all possible other uh, permutations. And those permutations are indexed by um, a modular transformation, an element of PSL2z. And one simply sums over these relative modular trends. You can phrase the contribution from all these other geometries as just being the original thing, but where one boundary is relative modular transformed relative to the other. And the sum of all that makes up the torus times integral amplitude. And the sum would be analogous to the uh, modular sum that appears in the Moomin Witten partition function. Now, it's worth pausing here for a little bit. Um, there is a caveat that comes with this computation, which is that we took a constrained first approach, meaning that we integrated out the Lagrange multiplier fields first in order to impose constraints, and then we quantized the residual system. Strictly speaking, what we just did is only guaranteed to work semi-classically. And for the following reason, um, if you take a gauge theory and you integrate out some Lagrange multipliers, well, before doing that, you should, you know, <laughs> gauge fix. It's part of the rules of the game. Um, and for different choices of the gauge, uh, this can modify the constraints uh, by something that involves the Fidea Popov ghosts. So, for instance, if you uh, did a similar quantization of Chern Simons, but in Lorentz gauge, well, the uh, constraint that you get from integrating out A naught is not just the usual Gauss law constraint, I mean, it follows a ghost by linear. Whereas if you use Coulomb gauge, you're good to go. Now for us, um, we, how to say, in our indirect approach, we assumed that this constraint, we, we basically followed this constraint first approach. Um, nevertheless, we have strong evidence that this was actually the right, how to say, that the answer that we land on is correct. And the evidence comes from other methods. In other words, this really is the torus times interval amplitude of 3D gravity. Under the assumption, again, that we're integrating over real, smooth, non-singular configurations. Um, I'll talk more about that evidence in a moment. Uh, or in a little bit. Uh, it was, that's the second of the two papers that Jordan and I wrote this summer. My apologies for the, the sense in which the, the talking about that, that was a little bit out of order. I had meant for that slide to appear before discussing the computation of the 3D gravity, this path integral in this setting. I meant for that to appear earlier, sorry. Um, a few words are in order about this maloney witten like modular sum, this thing that appears here, uh, because the, the prefactors, these non-compact boson partition function things, are a modular invariant. They just factor out of the sum. And what's left is, is this guy, 
Um, this modular sum is closely related to something called an Epstein zeta function, non holomorphic Epstein zeta function. And its properties are well understood by mathematicians. So we didn't have to work that hard to understand it. Um, in particular, it almost converges. The divergence in this thing is an additive pure constant independent of the complex structures. And what that means in practice is that, well, if you want to get a sense of what this thing is, um, this Fourier transform to fix spin. And as long as you're working at spin not equal to zero, you'll get a completely finite, well-defined modular sum. And at spin equals zero, there's just going to be a constant divergence, which is easy to pull off. At this point, we should pause though. We found a non-zero result for the torus times interval amplitude for a wormhole contribution. Uh, it's not unstable, it really does contribute. And so what do we make sense of this? Well, by the logic in the introduction about factorization, we would conclude that if ADS3 gravity is indeed a consistent theory of quantum gravity, um, then this wormhole is telling you that the dual is probably an ensemble rather than a particular representative, or maybe an ensemble of CFTs. And I say probably because, um, you know, when we study just this particular contribution, there's an infinite tower of other uh, contributions to a priori to the gravity path integral with two boundaries involving increasingly more and more complicated topology in the bulk. And well, we, how to say, we haven't computed those contributions, so we don't know if the thing that we computed dominates over the rest of the, the path integral. If it does, well, then these connected contributions would give a non-zero contribution um, to the two boundary partition function. And therefore, the only way out would be as if the dual is not a single instance of a CFT, but rather an ensemble. If this is true, then on average, the density of states for a CFT in this ensemble would look like the density of states you get from Maloney Witten after these things about negative norm states and whatnot. In other words, on average, the density of states would have a, a delta function telling you that there's the identity um, operator, and then a large party like spectrum starting off its life at the BTZ black hole threshold at C near C over uh, 12. Where did you get this equation from? Is that just from Maloney Witten? Um, I'm just, I'm being parametric here. The Maloney Witten density of states is much, 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 much more complicated. But if you look at, at large central charge um, energies, which are uh, order one values above, um, the BTZ threshold, the density of states is well approximated by the classical uh, BTZ density of states, which goes like e to the square root CE. Thank you. Thanks. That's Thank all I'm writing here. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So for your formula, for your partition function where the boundary is too tall, right? Um, did you say there is negative a uh, norm state in your sum or not? Oh, for this sum, we, um, no, I did not. I did not say that. There are oh. negative norm contributions that appear in the maloney witten partition function. Yes. So the one boundary thing. Yes. For ours, um, how to say, uh, something that we have not analyzed, we have not found negative norm states yet, oh. but that doesn't, we have not proved that there are no negative norm contributions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so under the provisional assumption then that 3D gravity is consistent and is dual to some ensemble, um, one might hope that the computation that we've done um, gives the dominant contribution to the fluctuation statistics of CFT partition functions in this ensemble, at least in some parametric regime of uh, complex structures. One can, can hope that that 
it's true, and see how far it goes and see what you learn. Um, with that, so you know, we in general, um, you would conclude that the connected two point function of the torus partition function, if all that's true, is the thing that we computed plus a contribution from other geometries which smoothly connect the two boundaries. Now, it's useful, you know, in the, in the CFT partition function, Virasoro implies that there's you know, most of the states that contribute are descendants. It's useful to consider the contribution just from primaries. In other words, the two point function of um, the primary counting partition function, which I'll call Z key. Well, um, that amounts to peeling off some infinite factors uh, from our result. And so what we would conclude then is that it's given by this thing that I write here, plus contributions from other geometries. And if we take this and study it in the limit of fixed spin, in other words, if we Fourier transform in the real parts of tau one and tau two, and if we study the low temperature limit, well, this modular sum simplifies dramatically. And what we end up finding is uh, this, is that the two-point function at thick of primaries at fixed spin takes a very particular formula with square roots of betas and, and e to the minus beta h, essentially, and a Kronecker delta setting spin of one equals spin of two. And there are also terms which are parametrically suppressed at low temperature by at least one factor of beta. And in this modular sum, those all come from terms in the sum with at least one S transformation. Now, why do I write this formula? Well, this is something that is familiar to a certain subset of physicists. It is, after a field redefinition, a two-point function in random matrix theory, in particular in an ensemble of large Hermitian matrices. So what do I mean by a uh, random matrix theory? Of, what I mean is an integral over large Hermitian matrices H, which are n by n, um, with some distribution, uh, some probability distribution, characterized by a potential V of H. Um, and while well, there are certain universal properties of uh, random matrix theory that emerge in the limit where the rank of this matrix N is taken to infinity, um, and also the domain on which you have um, a density of states uh, is taken to be so-called double scale starting off at some value and then running off to positive infinity. In that limit, there is a universal result in random matrix theory that, well, two-point function of Tracy of the minus beta H's is exactly um, this thing that I'm writing with its dependence on betas up to corrections um, that are, uh, of course, promising matrix models have a genus expansion. This is the leading contribution in the genus expansion of a matrix model. In other words, the 3D gravity result uh, lands you on what you would have guessed for this partition function from random matrix theory expectations. Uh, said another way, uh, the fluctuation statistics of BTZ microstates near threshold, so the things that you get at low temperature energies near the BTZ threshold, well, they're well described by random matrix theory uh, with Virasoro symmetry. It said yet another way, BTZ microstates, the ones corresponding to Virasoro primaries at fixed spin, they, our, our computation indicates that they exhibit eigenvalue repulsion. So that was the June paper. Um, given these caveats about constraint first, uh, and also these unconventional factors of I and choice of page group and so on, we wanted another route to the same result. Um, that appeared in a paper shortly thereafter in July. And the idea in this paper was to use some physical inputs from 3D gravity to try to bootstrap the amplitude, in a sense. Since we're running at the end here, I'll say just a couple words. The most important of these inputs, um, besides Virasoro symmetry on the boundaries, is the existence of something that we call the preamplitude, Z tilde, um, which 
is has the interpretation of the path integral where the gravity path integral where if you follow a spatial cycle of one boundary it becomes the spatial cycle of the other and same thing for the temporal ones and that the full 3d gravity path integral is comprised of a modular sum over this free amplitude that um, ingredient was quite powerful for us because then this pre-amplitude would be invariant under simultaneous modular transformations uh, acting on the two boundaries. Um, I don't have time, unfortunately, so I don't have time to discuss all of the details that go into this. There are some other inputs that we used, like that there are bulk Gauss laws that equate energy and momentum on the two boundaries. Um, also, some facts about uh, gravitational zero modes. Um, the net result after imposing this simultaneous modular invariance, double Virasoro symmetry, all these other things, is that um, we land on exactly our result from the June paper up to a normalization constant. And that normalization constant is fixed by a limit of 3D gravity where you take, um, how to say, you study high spin and low temperature in which uh, 3D gravity has a controlled approximation in terms of JT gravity, about which much is known. And that allows us to fix the normalization and we end up recovering the same result that we found by this constraint first method. So we consider this to be uh, strong evidence that what we did was correct, not just um, in a semi-classical approximation, but as an exact result. I wanna say a few words before going on about higher dimensions, bigger than two, bigger than three even. Before foraying into this world of first order, blah, 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 the thing I said I really wanted to do was to perform an integral over metrics. I'd like to return to that for the end of this talk. After all, something we would like to do is to embed our wormholes in our 3D ones into string theory, so for instance, in the context of D1, D5, as well as to study wormholes in more than three dimensions, maybe even make contact with ADS5 times S5. The problem, of course, is what I said earlier, that, um, you know, there, uh, there are no saddle points to expand around of this sort. No instantons to work around. Now, this thing of, of having no instantons to work around, but expecting there to be you know, something close to an instanton, this is not a new subject. Uh, this was something that was originally uh, considered in papers of Ian Affleck and collaborators in the early 80s, uh, before I was born. Um, as a simple example, consider four-dimensional uh, phi to the four theory with a wrong sign quartic term. Take it to be minus one in some units. As a well-defined perturbation theory, um, order by order in perturbation theory, of course, the whole theory doesn't exist. Um, and it also has uh, the classical massless model has instantons, non-trivial configurations of the uh, phi. And those instantons are characterized by a size modulus rho because the classical theory has a scale symmetry, as well as position moduli. And these instantons look like this. The massive model you can prove has no such solutions, the classical massive model. However, physically, you would expect that there are contributions from configurations like the, this, instantons like this, as long as the size of the instanton is much, 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 much smaller than the mass scale. In other words, you, know, you have an RG flow and the ultraviolet, you have the, the massless theory and it flows to something. And for very, very small instantons, those should contribute in a way that is basically the same as in the massless theory. However, you know, there no such solutions exist at finite mass. So how do you proceed? What do you do? What you'd like to do in words is to study configurations of fixed uh, size. So at fixed values of the size modulus. Um, once the mass is not zero, there are no longer solutions. 
Um, but they're still contributions to the path integral. They obey all the boundary conditions. And you can imagine integrating over them, at least at one loop, and maybe if you're adventurous, going beyond one loop. In practice, uh, one of the things that, that um, appears in these nice old papers of Affleck is a way to do this somewhat systematically, to arrive at these configurations in the massive theory and to start integrating over them. And the way you do it is by an insertion of the identity, it's the way I've written here. So you start off with like the functional integral of phi to the four theory, you introduce a new parameter zeta, as well as a delta function, which equates zeta to the integral over um, some operator built, some normalizable operator built out of phi, and which you then exponentiate. And the thing is, is that, well, now some, a fun fact is that you can find instanton solutions of the deformed equations of motion that you get in this model, the thing with action S plus this new term, at least at fixed lambda and zeta, these new parameters that you introduce. Once you extremize over them as well, well, you don't have a saddle point of the full system, but at fixed values of these new parameters, you can find instanton configurations. And these are the so-called constrained instantons. Constrained because, well, lambda is imposing a constraint that can be satisfied for these configurations. And the precise details of how things go from there is not terribly important for this talk. Um, the important lesson I want to draw from it here is that this method can be useful for finding non-perturbative configurations in a quantum field theory which one can then path integrate over using more conventional techniques. These configurations, you can think of them as near saddles that give, they're not unstable uh, configurations, but they're not saddles either. The action varies over in a finite number of directions in field space, but nevertheless, they give important non-perturbative contributions to the path integral. All these words apply um, to the problem of finding Euclidean wormhole configurations in pure Einstein gravity. Rather than say a lot of things, uh, let me just give an example. Consider this um, Euclidean metric that I've indicated here. This is topologically torus, d-dimensional torus times interval. And um, well, it's a fairly simple form. It's labeled by some parameter b, as well as by some uh, functions f that index a relative translation of one boundary compared to the other. So you can do that. And well, this is an example of the Euclidean wormhole. It's not a, it's a constrained instanton in this language. It's not a solution to the field equations, but it's the next best thing. It's a bottleneck geometry if you think about it. The warp factor here multiplying the torus is like Cosh. So it goes to some, it goes to one at rho equals zero. So the neck of the bottleneck has a volume proportional to B to the D. And so the space is smooth, non-singular as long as B is non-negative. And then I also said that there are these relative translations of one boundary to the other, call those things twist. Together, um, this parameter B and these twists comprise, uh, you can think of them as a moduli space. They parameterize a moduli space of wormholes. If you evaluate the gravitational action on this configuration, you get something, well, that depends on B. And it is in this sense in which this thing is not a saddle point. Only becomes a saddle when this parameter b uh, controlling the size of the torus or the size of the bottleneck goes to zero. In other words, where the wormhole pinches off. You might wonder why this configuration and not any number of other metrics that you can write down that smoothly connect two boundaries. Well, I'll tell you. If you evaluate the spatial components of the Einstein's equations, the things in, along the torus directions, those are identically zero for this configuration. The row row component is not, um, but it's very close to that. It's a constant in some sense after multiplying by root g. 
if you think about this for a few minutes, and if we had some more time, you would see that therefore this um, wormhole is a saddle point of a deformed action, where to Einstein-Hilbert, you append an action, a, a term that is proportional to the length of the of, of a trajectory that connects the two boundaries to each other. And this would be the analog of the deformation um, I discussed the O that one would use to find the constrained instanton in massive phi to the four theory. This configuration that I just wrote down, it's highly symmetric. The conformal structures on the two boundary tori are in some sense aligned. Um, whereas, you know, the most general problem would be one where they are just whatever they are, independent values. Um, we don't know how to solve that problem analytically, but we do know how to do, uh, find a lot of other wormholes. So for instance, we know how to find the most general wormholes in three dimensions where, which are topologically torus times interval. That is where the two conformal structures on the two boundary are whatever they are, independent. We can study linearized perturbations around the symmetric configuration. If we pick out a direction of this d-dimensional torus and call it time, then we can arrange for the, the inverse temperature on the two boundaries to be different. We can study wormholes in ADS5, where the boundary is S1 times S3. This would be telling us something about microstates of um, ordinary ADS Schwarzschild black holes, where the boundary is S1 times S3. And we can even find wormholes where the boundary is a d-dimensional sphere. I'll conclude with a couple of comments about stability. Um, you might wonder, these are some new non-perturbative contributions to the gravity path integral. These are new instantons. Is the one loop um, path integral well-defined? Modulo of the usual issues. That is to say, are these things um, quadratically stable upon adding small fluctuations? If we talk about these highly symmetric wormholes, well, this is, this is a little hard, but it's not too bad to do, actually. It turns out that the quadratic fluctuations of the metric in this background are completely stable. So is Maxwell theory. So are scalars, as long as their mass squared lies above the BF bound. And at the BF bound, it's not that you're unstable, it's just there's a, a zero mode. So from the point of view of effective field theory on this space time, well, it's completely stable. What about embedding into string theory? Well, say ADS5 times S5. D here is the number of boundary dimensions. So let's set D equal to four and append the five sphere. Turns out you can embed that configuration into ADS5 times S5 rather easily by just attaching a Ramon Ramon flux background to this, which has n units of flux. Essentially, by the discussion that I gave earlier about fluctuations in the metric and everything else being stable in this background, that implies that supergravity on this background is um, quadratically stable. What about brains? You might wonder if there is a, a probability of nucleating brains in this setting. After all, there's a constant Ramon Ramon flux background. So you might wonder if there's an analog of the Schlinger effect, whereby brain anti brain pairs nucleate in this geometry since they're immersed in some flux. So, well, we can study that quite easily. Uh, consider a three brain wrapped on the four dimensional torus at fixed location along the wormhole, this coordinate row. A general three brain would be characterized then by some effective mass M and charge Q with a BPS bound. So M better be bigger than or equal to Q. For D3, of course, the charge is equal to mass. Um, and for anti D3, it's M equals um, minus Q. Um, but it's interesting to allow for them to be detuned from each other to see what happens. 
It turns out that for all mass bigger than charge, um, there's a solution to the three brain equations of motion where the brain can sit at some fixed value of the radial coordinate. And that value goes off to infinity as you take the BPS limit. That's the case always, thanks to this flux background. However, um, for small charge, uh, the, the, this effect, the, the solution exists, but it increases the action. Um, as you, if you imagine low, increasing the charge continuously, however, there is a threshold, a critical value of charge to mass ratio, above which um, adding a brain actually lowers the action of the configuration. In particular, the, for D3 brains in ADS5 times S5, well, yeah, it lowers the action. And I'm two slides away from being done, sorry. This is a pair production instability of this wormhole, whereby three brain pairs nucleate. They screen the Ramon Ramon flux that's supporting the whole wormhole. And, well, there's an instability of this thing within string theory. What is the endpoint? Um, we don't know. But the one comment I can make is that if there is an endpoint that is accessible within the supergravity approximation, it has to be a disconnected configuration rather than a connected one. All the wormholes we have found, I gave some like lists where there's a whole bunch of these things that we found. Um, they are always unstable, we find, within string theory. And we don't have a proof that this is always the case, but all the ones that we have found are indeed unstable. Um, which instability it is depends on the details of the wormhole. Usually it's to brain nucleation, but sometimes might scalars condense. So for instance, if we're talking about ADS5 times S5 with S1 times S3 boundary, then for very big wormholes are unstable to brain, free brain nucleation, but small wormholes are unstable to light scalar condensation. It's tempting, therefore, to assert some sort of principle. Some, it's the year 2020, so maybe there's a censorship principle at work here, um, whereby Euclidean wormholes are always unstable in string theory, perhaps. And by there's a caveat, I would mean wormholes connecting Euclidean ADS regions. But didn't you prove that at the beginning? I said saddle points have this property. No, but you proved at the beginning that the partition function has to factorize. Well, that, that is certainly true, but how it works, how to say, I would pose it as a question in gravity. How does that, that is, a, I would say that that's a consistency condition that has to be obeyed by string theory. How is that actually achieved? Like it wasn't, you know, we can find these configurations. Why should it be the case? Like a priori, that would be a reason to expect that this is the case, but expecting and showing are different things. Are I these guess, types of configurations never supersymmetric? These configurations are not supersymmetric. Do you know that they never are? Um, I don't know that. I guess another easy check would be an SNS background in ADS3. Yeah. So, I mean, well, but that's related. Okay. So you can, um, yes, indeed. Um, or you can, but I mean, that's going to be related by uh, an SL2Z transformation. I mean, if you study how to say the, the, the exactly which nucleation instability you find depends on details. So for F1 and S5, then, um, you know, one strings in the ADS3 description, those are unstable. All the things that you can build out of D1s and are F1s and NS3s. Whereas D1 brains would be stable in that. So the details of course, you know, the exactly which things are unstable, that depends on the details. But what we're finding is that there's always an instability. And it's, I, 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 it's a fair point so hard that, how to say, this should, this, 
this should be always the case within string theory that these wormholes are unstable, but um, I don't, I, I would say, I'm not sure that I would say I proved it at the beginning. No, it's fair enough. But that's the reason I've never understood what is this discussion about JT gravity being about? Because one should expect that all these things eventually disappear. Right. Well, maybe I'll, I'll finish with this. Maybe I'll make one. So I'm still puzzled. I'm happy to see that all these configurations are unstable because I would like to believe in the sacrosanct status of ADS CFT. In particular, that CFT partition functions factorize. Um, but I have some, some worry that uh, it's not enough that these configurations are unstable. Uh, within ordinary quantum field theory, we know of plenty of instances where subleading saddles um, contribute to the path integral. That's almost by definition. But we know of examples in quantum mechanics where complex or unstable saddles can uh, contribute to the path integral. For instance, um, quantum mechanics with the quartic potential. And something that it, it bugs me in the sense that I, I just don't know how to prove it yet. I'd like to be able to prove that these um, instantons we're finding don't contribute to string theory in ADS5 times S5, period. Not just that they're unstable, but that they don't contribute at all. And I don't know how to do that. So to my mind, I would say that what we're doing, finding these instabilities, this is really a step in the right direction. Um, but the, there is an open question about how ADS CFT remains as we usually understand it. And that's my last comment. So thank you very much for your time and for kindly not yelling at me as I went over time. Let's test our session for questions or comments. Yes, Joel, please. Hmm? So I actually uh, have a, a question. Uh, so Christian, uh, just to confirm, so did you say that like all these uh, constraint in syndrome configurations are solutions of, so the momentum constraint, but like they violate the Hamiltonian constraint. Is that always the case? Ah, um, yes. The ones that we're finding always violate the Hamiltonian. If you, okay, so for everyone else in the audience, if you think of rho as Euclidean time, and you think of, uh, how to say, uh, talking about Euclidean Einstein gravity and the canonical formalism, then yes, these things correspond to like Hamiltonian equals constant configurations. Right, so in some sense, they solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, but I mean, they, like, it's not the proper Hamilton-Jacobi equation for gravity because I mean, that would violate diffeomorphisms like in the radial coordinate. Mm -hmm. But in some sense, it's the standard hamilton jacob equation that you would expect, like, I mean, from quantum mechanics. Yes, yes, I believe that, yes. Right. I so, would stress uh, that from a practical point of view, I, the way I view this, this thing here with modifying the constraints, I don't, this is a, a bad definition for the quantum theory. This deformation is not age invariant. Right. But uh, it is useful as, a, as an intermediate step in locating these configurations. Right. So, and, and a second question is like, uh, all this depends like very much on the boundary conditions you are imposing, right? I mean, so here you, you impose like brown Hainaut on, on, on the asymptotic boundaries, right? Yeah, this is for all brown Hainaut, that's right. Right. So, uh, have you thought how this would change? Like if you impose like comparison Strominger, for example, like in... We have not had a chance to analyze that. Okay. Thank you. One thing we, we did check um, was if we introduce uh, the, um, you know, I've, I've been working throughout in rate units where the ADS radius is one. And if we restore it, we can ask about the large radius limit of these configurations, a flat space. We can also ask about um, a De Sitter version of the story. And what happens is that as we take the flat space limit, um, these bottlenecks just become ordinary empty space. It just becomes R to the D plus one. That is, that is one easy thing to look at. And in Desitter, um, the, these kinds of methods, what they do is they allow you to find, um, I would say, um, 
asymptotically to sitter space times, which allow for a more general boundary topology than you get just by solving the classical equations in motion. So for instance, you can find um, this, uh, configurations which interpolate between the torus in the past and the torus in the future, which would contribute to the probability, the, the amplitude to uh, go from the torus in the far past to a torus in the far future. And the thing is, is that within, um, there's no saddle point that describes that process. So the leading contribution to that process would come from such an instanton. I had a question, can I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, maybe it's a very stupid <laughs> question, but uh, if you imagine an ensemble of CFTs mm -hmm. whereby you, as you did, it was your matrix model, whereby you assume that the dimensions of primaries are randomized, mm -hmm. uh, does that preserve Virasaurus symmetry? Like the things that you get after randomizing mm -hmm. over these things, do they still obey Virasaurus? word identities? So what we mean, yeah, so how does Virasoro play with this? No, it's, it's a good question. We, we thought about this for a while. Well, uh, just for the context, uh, like three, two years ago, I wrote a paper with Offer on disordered systems, uh -huh. where we just averaged in some couplings. Mm -hmm. And we basically showed that you can lose conformal symmetry, even if the average looks perfectly conformal. Absolutely. You can get log CFTs, you can get various leaf sheet things, like bizarre things. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the statement, I mean, how to say, one way of saying it is that a, the average of a primary, like if you have a CFT labeled by some continuous parameters that you average over, then an average of a primary operator is not necessarily a primary of the average. That is one way of saying it. I completely agree with that statement. Um, but you're imposing Virasoro all the time, so how does that uh, square? Uh, play with it. The way it plays with it is that, um, how to say, um, well, the one should think of, let's see, what's the way of saying it? I mean, in qualitative terms, because when we, when we, if we say that the primaries have randomized statistics, then the, the statement of Virasoro symmetry is just that all of the other states, all of the descendants, their energies, their quantum numbers are fixed by the, those of the primaries. I see. So you're sort of, you found a way of averaging, which does preserve, you claim, Virasoro. <laughs> We, we found a way of parametrizing observables, um, averages, in such a way that preserves Virasoro. I would not say that we have found a way of averaging CFTs in a way that preserves Virasoro. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I mean, we're doing is a gravitational computation. And when we parametrize it, it is convenient to strip off the contribution from descendants in the usual way. And then physically, what are we saying? Well, we're saying that the primaries are randomized. We don't know how to get at them except from doing a gravity computation and just asserting that it means something, that 3D gravity exists. But and at the level, the, along for the ride. at the philosophical level, why do we even expect that uh, the thing you randomize over is a CFT? Um, I mean, in, in so JK Grav, as in opposed to something else. I would say modular invariance is probably the biggest clue. Well, we do have modular invariance. In particular, we have, um, uh, let's see. So I didn't say this um, because I said too much already. So this is our full, where is our full result? It's this thing. This thing is invariant under independent modular transformations of the two boundary tori. Yes, this is the distance, by the way. This formula is the distance in, in the Poincaré plane. Exactly, that's right. Well, it's, yeah, it's related, yeah, there's some cautions and yeah, yeah. It's, it's a function of the distance between points tau one, tau two and complex plane or tau one, gamma, tau two. Okay, so um, if you interpret um, this torus times interval thing as contributing to the two point function, the connected two point function, 
This independent modular invariance would imply the thing that you're sampling, the, the partition function z, is modular invariant. I see. I because see. I it's see a, like, right you know, at one point, how to say, if you have something with the global symmetry, I'm oh, sorry, it, it's telling you that the thing that you're sampling is itself modular invariant. And then I would say, OK, well, up to the, the other things about you know, positive norm density, uh, positive density of states and so on, that looks and smells like a CFT partition function and not some other random function of tau. And how do you grapple with the fact that there are no continuous parameters, at least not that we believe that they exist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so it's a good question. Um, what we have, let's see, I said one of the other worm, so something that we couldn't analyze using our phase space, first order Hamiltonian, blah, 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 was a worm, oh no, I went too far. Um, this last point five, wormholes with sphere boundary. We can find wormholes that are topologically S2 times interval, mm -hmm. which we would think, well, that looks like the variance of the sphere partition function, assuming that it's you know finite and non-zero. And mm -hmm. it's something that I'm analyzing currently with Jordan and then another student at Stanford, Brandon Rayshon, is whether or not that thing at one loop is zero thanks to some ghost zero mode or something, or if it's finite. And if it's finite, what is it? Um, if it's non-zero, then how would you interpret that amplitude? Well, that's giving you the variance in the central charge because the sphere partition function is basically the central charge. And so then we would infer that this average is not at fixed central charge, that you would sample maybe, how to say, uh, well, all possible CFTs maybe, or maybe just some large, you know, something within a bin of uh, around an average central charge. Well, I don't want to hijack the discussion, but that would make uh, very little sense if you want to assume Virasoro, because Virasoro has a central extension. You can't have Virasoro and also average over the central extension. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I this has puzzled me as well. From gravity, yeah, from gravity, yes. I agree with that statement. Um, I guess the, the principle that we are kind of saying, our, our approach to this problem sort of philosophically is to, to compute as much as we can in gravity to make, I mean, you have to make rules. So make rules, follow them and see what you get. And then try to understand uh, what this means in CFT and then follow that. Um, and as far as that goes, I think we're, we're playing by the rules, but I, I guess maybe 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 it's uh, it's jumping the gun a bit to say something about um, varying the central charge. We should finish this computation first. Any other comment or question? Uh, is there time for one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you. You didn't have time to talk uh, about the bootstrap calculation of your partition function. Right. But may I just ask, does the bootstrap, does your bootstrap method uh, give you the ordinary Maloney within partition function? Uh, no, no. So the a key point about this method is that, so this torus times interval is independently modular invariant under the modular transformations of the two boundary tori. But it's built out of something, um, it's a modular sum over something that is itself um, has a kind of like a diagonal uh, modular invariance. I see, I see. So that's the. Whereas in Maloney Witten, the thing that you're modular summing has no such. Uh, right. Yeah, 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 I see. Okay. So we can exploit the, it's this thing that we're modular summing that is amenable to analysis. Okay, I see. More questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah. Um, is it even possible that the, um, I mean, the theories on which you do the average are not conformal at all? I mean, SYK and the conformality emerges after the average. Am I right? SYK is more or less like that, right? I mean, the, 
let's say, the conformality in the two-point function in the low energy and so on emerges only after the, the average. I mean, the single representative is not conformal at all. So in general, is there a way to guess uh, which theories are participating to the ensemble or something like that? No, right? I mean, what we have is that, uh, how to say, um, the, the, the gravitational physics guarantees that the torus, that these partition functions that we study are modular invariant. That would be true for torus as well as for higher genus. And um, how to say, um, each boundary is also equipped with a Virasoro asymptotic symmetry. So from that point of view, it looks an awful lot like you're averaging CFTs uh, rather than some, I mean, how to say, the, the boundary, all the physics of ADS3 gravity near the boundary with these boundary conditions is that of conformal field theory with Virasoro. So it looks like Virasoro. Um, right, but I guess but, there's a but this is uh, sorry, this is somehow after the average in the, I mean, the, the, the picture is after the average in the CFT, right? The thing is, though, is that because, how to say, um, the, because this would be true for all the endpoint functions, how to say, um, yeah, because that would be true for all the endpoint functions, that would also be true not just for the ensemble average, but also the things that you are averaging. Like if you, in other words, yeah. If you have like a system which um, an ensemble of quantum mechanical systems were point by point in the ensemble, you have a U1 symmetry, but that U1 symmetry is not, doesn't um, commute in a sense with the ensemble average, then ensemble, you know, one point functions will be invariant under the symmetry, but two point functions won't. Whereas if the, in a sense, the, the symmetry commutes with the ensemble average, it's there in, for each element, then um, how to say, in other words, if you're averaging symmetric systems, then the average, then all the endpoint functions will be invariant under the symmetry. So from that point of view, I would say that the, the things that we get from gravity have modular invariance and your Soro asymptotic symmetry for each boundary, that is for all these endpoint functions, I would say that looks like we're averaging CFTs, but with that said, um, this would go back to the discussion with Sohar. There is some tension with a the statement that you know we don't expect there to be um, continuous families of CFTs to average over at fixed large central charge, um, or that uh, how to say this thing with the the sphere wormholes. I don't know how all of this gets put together yet. Okay. But so uh, somehow, I mean, taking your message, uh, I should believe that also in SYK, before the average, I should see some conformality in the, let's say, suppose that I take the schwinder dijkstra equation before the average, uh, for which I don't have the melonic dominance and so on. Also, that schwinger dijkstra equation should have some conformality somehow. I, th I think SYK is near conformal. It's not really an ADS boundary. Yeah, that is true. That is true. But uh, you can see the conformal symmetry of the Schwinger dies on uh, in the in the low um, in the low temperature limit. I want to say, um, I think the you you don't see it in how to say you see it in if you will the the analog in SYK of what I'm saying for the two point function of torus partition function would be the four point function of the fermions. I which see. has a contribution which dominates the conform, like it's not conformally invariant at low energies. Ah, okay, I see. Okay, I see. If you look at sufficiently higher moments, they'll uncover the fact that the conformal symmetry is only some um, approximate feature. Okay. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, we are running out of time, so let's thank the speaker again for his wonderful talk. This is the end of this morning session. And I guess we'll see you guys in this afternoon. Right. Oh. Oh. Thanks All right. Thanks. Bye, Chris. Bye. Enjoy your afternoon. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. How do I